Bahamians now. The Bohemian attitude has one serious drawback. It can easily spiral off into willful eccentricity. Are you taking it for a walk? Yeah, I'm taking it for a walk. It's a new kind of pet. In 1850, the French poet Gérard de Nerval ceased conforming to bourgeois ideas of suitable pets and acquired a lobster, which he led around Paris on the end of a blue ribbon. Oh my God. Is that real? Yeah, it's a lobster. Oh, touch it. It's called Augustus. See? It's sweet, isn't it? Why should a lobster be any more ridiculous than a dog? Nerval questioned. They're peaceful, serious creatures. They know the secrets of the sea, and they don't bark. Whatever the eccentricities of certain Bohemians, the Bohemian movement's enduring contribution has been to stand up for an alternative way of life. It has lent dignity and seriousness to a set of values overlooked by the bourgeois mainstream. Like Christianity, of which it was in many ways a secular replacement, appearing at just the time when Christianity was beginning to lose its grip on the imagination of people, Bohemia stood up for a spiritual as opposed to a material way of evaluating ourselves and others. Come on. The whole idea of ownership is just so utterly vulgar. Why would one want to own anything? This is my car, big deal. It looks much like someone else's my car. Everyone's got a my, and what does it reflect? Nothing except, you know, what Volvo said you ought to have. They buy the lie. They do buy the lie of the new car every year, of the house that you have to own. I really feel that people have been robbed of life. I really do feel they've been robbed of the freedom of choice, the freedom of understanding and enjoying the world that we live in, in, in its infinite and finite beauty. People have been robbed and they've been sold this lie, hook, line and sinker. In the Essex countryside near Harlow, I found bohemian values alive and well. Penny Rambeau and G. Voucher are members of Crass, an anarcho-punk music and art collective they founded in the late 1970s. The door is never closed to anybody, you know, and... Any, uh, anyone who comes to the door, you'll let them in? We, they will always be welcome. And uh, there is a, 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 you know, an unspoken understanding that you come to share, not to take. I mean, we have stra had strangers that come into the house and they've fallen asleep on the sofa. You think, well, that's incredible. They feel so safe, you know. And that, I think that's quite a, you know, I think that's a wonderful what? thing to happen, you know. And, mm. and you can be in the middle of just about to serve a meal up and maybe <clears> three or four people come through the door. And it's like feeding the 5,000. It does stretch. It's not a problem. We grow a lot of food. We grow most of our food. We have a yeah. choice of maybe 10 vegetables in the winter. And we have a, a choice of maybe 15 in the summer. So, I mean, yes, we're self-sufficient if you don't fancy other foods that sometimes you fancy, you know. And, it's not uh, so much a matter of, do, uh, of doing without as, as doing with. I mean, we naturally do without. You know, and so anything else, I mean, if G goes shopping or if I go shopping, we come back with, you know, chocolate biscuits, then that's, that is what, how other people would see being without a bazooka, I mean, because it's actually, that's a special treat, you know, and we're all a little bit excited about it. in two minutes. Yes. <laughs> and, and so we've learned to live very, very simply, and one can live very, very simply, and it's to do with expectations. Do you think of yourself as a bohemian? I mean, does that word appeal to you? It appeals to me more than the other things that, that, that people like ourselves are often defined as being. I mean, because I, I, I like the historical context of it. I mean, I think a bohemian essentially seeks an authenticity. There are many cynical people who, for example, they might watch you in the garden and say, oh, these are just two old hippies yeah, yeah. living in the country. What, yeah. what do you think about 
that attitude. I don't really mind at all what people think. That's their business, isn't it? I mean, I don't really care what people think. I don't, I'm not, it really does not concern me what other people think. So you really have, in a way, managed to completely <clears throat> uncouple yourself from concerns about status? I don't, I don't even understand. I mean, I, when I say I don't understand the meaning of the word, I mean, I understand it in the dictionary sense. You I just don't feel it. I don't, it's I not just, an emotion you recognise. I can't comprehend it. Penny and G have made real material sacrifices to live the way they do. But perhaps we don't need to starve ourselves of chocolate biscuits to gain something of their mental calm. I'm going to suggest some ways that we can all deal better with our anxieties about how well we're doing in life. Marcus Aurelius was Roman Emperor from 161 to 180 AD. As such, he was the man with the highest status on the planet. But he was also, unusually for people who rule the world, a philosopher. Marcus Aurelius stood in a long philosophical tradition of writing about status, one dating back to the ancient Greeks 600 years before him. And the enduring legacy of that tradition has been to insist that what you're worth has very little to do with what other people think of you. Marcus Aurelius wrote his great work of philosophy, The Meditations, whilst he was battling against bloodthirsty Germanic hordes on the furthest frontiers of his empire. I just do a quick health and safety, because they're very conscious here. Can we make sure that any pointy sharp things are on that side of the rope um, when we're back here? There was a disappointing turnout when I came to watch the Colchester Roman Society but they went on undeterred. Marcus Aurelius would have been proud of them. As an emperor, his behavior would have been endlessly examined, praised by some, criticized by others. But he was aware of how untrustworthy it all was. He wrote his meditations to remind himself to submit any views he heard about his character and achievements to his own reason before allowing them to affect his estimation of himself. My decency does not depend on the testimony of someone else. Will any man despise me? Let him see to it. But I will see to it that I may not be found doing or saying anything which deserves to be despised. The Colchester Romans, like their most philosophical emperor, know better than to judge their own performance by the amount of applause they receive. Philosophy isn't saying that you're always admirable in everything that you do. Where it's really useful is in helping you to decide for yourself, by a process of logical thinking, how much justice lies in the world's assessment of you. Perhaps the most trenchant advocate of this tradition was the 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. He said, We will gradually become indifferent to what goes on in the minds of other people, when we acquire an adequate knowledge of the superficial nature of their thoughts, of the narrowness of their views, and of the number of their errors. Whoever attaches a lot of value to the opinions of others pays them too much honor. The winner for the transformation of the Able Representative is Able Cosmetics.